Hello to our listeners. Um, this is episode eight, and today we're going to talk about families and family dynamics, um, healthy families versus unhealthy families, nurturing families versus troubled families, functional families versus dysfunctional families, and just kind of look at some of the differences and the traits that hopefully we'll all want to um, create more of in our lives. I'm here, of course, with Sarah Schaffner, and this um, podcast is sponsored by Family Services of Sioux Falls. My name, of course, is Mary Eggleston. So the thing that I hear from people is I'll have people say to me, all families are dysfunctional. And I look at them and I say, well, that's absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between a functional family and a dysfunctional family is not a matter of what happens to the family, but how they respond to what happens. A, a functional family, um, when something happens, and, and things happen to every family, there's always stressors. They look to, okay, what's going on? How is it affecting us? How do we move through it? How do we maybe try to solve it? How do we take care of everybody as we deal with this? And I think that's where people get dysfunction and stress confused. Yes. yes, all families have stress. They all go through mm -hmm. uh, trying times, but like you said, it's a right. matter of how you respond. A car and accident how, can yeah. happen to anybody. Right. And, you know, or a death can happen. Absolutely. And so, and that happens, you know, if you read the news, it happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, people can get into all kinds of difficult situations. Um, it doesn't mean that you're dysfunctional because it happens. It's what you do in response to it. Yeah. So... The dysfunctional family, what they tend to do is they pretend it's not happening, no one speaks of it, or they blame one person, but just relentlessly. There's a lot of yelling and screaming and um, just um, a splattering. There's over-focus on just one aspect of it. Um, sometimes what you'll see is um, the architects of the family, who of course are the parents, lose themselves into what they need and it doesn't even occur to them to talk to their kids about it. I've had so many families where I'll say, so, you know, when you talk to your kids about this, you know, like, what are they saying? They go, well, we've never talked to them about it. Well, they don't say anything. Well, I know a lot about that family. <laughs> if your kids are not talking about a major car accident that happened or that um, dad just got sober from his alcoholism, but nobody's, no one's talking no one's about talking. it. I mean, those, those are really significant. And I don't know. I mean, they've just never brought it up. Uh-huh. And that's, that's the dysfunction right. in families. Yeah. That, that space to bring things up, to have those conversations, was never created. Yeah. Oh, that's a good way to put it. The space to yeah. bring things up. The safety right. within that space yeah. where I can say what I need to say. So, you know, a family exists for the well-being and welfare of its individual ma members. I mean, that's why families exist. And and yet there are so many people, I don't know why they think they have a family because it was something they were supposed to do. A lot of people, unfortunately, have children because they want someone to love them, not okay. that they're wanting to love a child. You know, and then you had talked about um, today talking about the whole person wheel, Sarah. What are the parts of that? Um, well, there's several parts of that. Um, and as we look at each part, each part needs to be healthy, needs to be nurtured in order for a person to create those healthy relationships, to create that healthy family atmosphere. But those parts would be social, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, volitional. And so those would be the six parts. However, we can talk a little bit about what those parts consist of. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll take spiritual. Okay. You know, understanding who you are and where where you're at spiritually. This does not mean um, religion. Um, people mix spiritual and religion together all the time, and that that isn't um, that isn't the case. You can be a very spiritual person and not be religious at all. You can be a religious person and actually not be spiritual, or you can be both. A, you know, the spirituality of someone is you know what is their image of God. Why do they believe that they're here? 
Um, do they have a sense of wanting to um, live inside their own value system? Do they have a sense of what virtue is, what integrity is? Um, do they feel accountable to something um, bigger than themselves? And so the spiritual aspects of someone are really important. And what I've seen in, in families who get very rigid about that, the, again, the more dysfunctional family, is they will decide this is how to, what you're to believe, this is how you believe it, and there is no wiggle room there. We're gonna shove that right down your throat. I have a family right now where the mother says, I don't know why my daughter won't talk to me. Why won't she talk to me? And to which I said, well, every time she tries to talk to you, what you say to her is that you want to save her soul. And what she's saying is not valid. There's no legitimacy to it. She's not allowed her own um, exploration. She's not allowed to even have her own thoughts. So she's hiding her thoughts and her beliefs from you. And they're not in the open and they're not being discussed because you are not interested in what she feels resonates with her spiritually. So that would be okay. one example. And I don't mean that spirituality needs to be this big um, hodgepodge anything goes, but there needs to be an openness and a flow of conversation um, if you actually believe that you have to run around and defend God and Jesus, um, it's just not going to go well. And I'm going to tell you that I don't think God and Jesus need you to defend them. I think they'll, they'll be just fine without your defense. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I know um, I'll take emotional next, but as you were speaking of that, it reminded me of that, that self-awareness that we've tried to focus on and help people gain more self-awareness. And when you were talking about, you know, people don't want to talk to me or people won't express things to me, that might be a good sign that there might be some, some work that needs to be done there. It might be. <laughs> and, and if you're the child that feels like you can't talk to your family members, that's also a good sign that there was probably some dysfunction yeah. in your family. Okay, sorry, back on track. I'm taking the emotional okay. section of the wheel. We didn't uh, agree on this, incidentally. She's just <laughs> picking and choosing. Okay. Um, so people, I think, sometimes get scared of their emotions because of whether it's pain or they're just not sure how to handle their emotions. So a lot of times in a dysfunctional family, that emotion just won't be expressed. And then in a healthy family, you'll see more of that expression. Uh, but I think it's important for people to realize that as long, if, as, long as your emotions are harnessed at some level, you can't be flying off the handle on everything that um, triggers some type of emotion. But as long as they're harnessed and expressed appropriately, that is okay. And that's what should be done. Uh, also, all feelings in and of themselves are healthy. The, the part that gets unhealthy is how you express those emotions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And yeah, so what you see in an unhealthy family, of course, um, if there's a belief that there are emotions that are not allowed or that for whatever reason, um, the experience is that somehow they threaten the family itself, you'll see people pull away um, or they become aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, insults happen. Or um, a very popular one here in the upper Midwest is passive aggressive. Yeah. You know, I'll just, I'll it's get very you popular. later. Yeah, yeah, it's very popular. <laughs> I'll just keep this to myself and I'll stab you in the back later. <laughs> um, another popular one around here is to deny and pretend that nothing happened. Yeah. You yeah. know, my younger brother who lives in Chicago um, was talking to a friend of his um, in Puerto, from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about families in the upper Midwest. And, and, and we grew up in North Dakota. And of course, he's this friend is from Puerto Rico and, and has that kind of um, dynamic in his family. And he was saying, yeah, when my family gets mad, everybody's, you know, all worked up and yelling and screaming and blah, 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 blah. And, and he goes, you know, and Ben said, uh, yeah, that's not at all what we do. And he goes, well, what do you do? We say, well, if you're upset, you say through your teeth, we'll talk later. And then you never do. Right, right. And his friend went, what? You never do? And he goes, no, you never do. So the Puerto Rican <laughs> friend is saying, you know, this is how crazy it gets. And people go too far with, you know, if it's dysfunctional. Yeah. And my younger brother said, yeah, we just, yeah, we just will talk later. 
And then you never do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And I, very, very true. I worked with a woman who told me that when she was growing up, she came home in high, from high, in high school and she was extremely drunk, passed out in the hall, drunk on the floor. She said literally her parents stepped over her and never said a word about it. She said, we didn't talk about anything that was ever meaningful. They stepped over me. So if you don't talk about it, then it didn't happen? I Is guess. I this? guess just shove it down and we'll just shame you with the yeah. way we look at you, the way we ignore you. I mean, yeah. but we never talk. We don't talk. So which one are we going to do now? I don't know. Well, Let's we can do physical. Let's do physical. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, taking care of your body. Mm -hmm. Um, is it attended to? You know how how it, how are you fed within a family? Is what comes to mind. I think about how um, I actually had to learn how to feed myself when I became an adult because the the food choices, though they were delicious, my mother was a great cook, were just not the healthiest. Oh, right. And so I took an um, an active interest in understanding nutrition and how to take care of my body when I became. Um, an adult really trying to understand, oh, a fruit, a vegetable, ooh, interesting. You know, and fried foods, oh, yeah, don't do that. You know, just different <laughs> things like that. And I've eaten your food, so you've done oh, an amazing thanks. job. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love to cook. That's another, well, you're I'll good do at a it. podcast on cooking. <laughs> no, actually, I probably won't, no. <laughs> and then, but I, I think one more thing in regards to the physical is that, that can almost be a foundation for all of the other ones. As long as you're taking care of your body physically, that's, that's a great starting point it um, is. as you start to work on some of the other yeah. sections. And you can't say to your kids, hey, you need to exercise if you never do. Right. You can't say to your kids, don't eat so much candy, don't drink so much pop, if that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really do um, have to be the leaders in the family. Not, we're not the followers. Yeah. You know, if I'm eating a whole bag of Doritos, um, it's just not going to work for me to wonder why my kid is eating a whole bag of Doritos. So, right. so our kids, they, they do what they see us do, not what we tell them to do. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you do now, Sarah? Oh, let's see here. Um, social, we can go there. Um, I think just... As being humans, we're natural social creatures. Yeah. And even if you don't have a lot of people around you, you might work with other people or you might go to church with other people or um, a variety of different scenarios. You're going to have to interact with people. And that's just a part of um, ourselves that we need to nurture and make sure that we're having those and connections. And in a functional family, you can move in and out of getting to know people outside of your family. You can yeah. flow in, you can flow out, you can bring them home, yeah. you can go to see them, and there it's it does not threaten the family system. But in a dysfunctional family, if the family has big secrets, like mom gets beaten up by dad, mm -hmm. or um, mom's drunk all the time, or uh, any number of secrets that might be in the house, yeah. or there's just paranoia in, in, in the family of yeah. one person, even one person having that creates that atmosphere. Then there's a, a rule of you don't really bring people home and you yeah. don't go anywhere. We don't allow people to move in and out. Yeah of our, there's a barrier. It's very that's unpredictable. Built. So yeah. you and wouldn't you see families like that. Yeah. I remember my kids, had some friends like that where they um, they would always come to our house and I'd say, well, are you going to go over to their house? And I kind of know what I'm doing there. I'm just, yeah. I've kind of <laughs> taken a temperature. Yeah. And I can remember a couple kids, no, we, we can't go over there. Mm -hmm. You know, they just, um, I guess, I guess they don't ever pick up their house. And I think, okay, that's, that's hard. Yeah. And there'd be one little pathway maybe through the house because somebody's a hoarder. Mm -hmm. You know, any number any of number. reasons. But that's the function against versus dysfunction. Right. And I think that leaves mental. And, you know, are you allowed to pursue your own thoughts? Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to develop your own philosophies? Your and own express them. <laughs> and express them. Can yeah. you discuss them? 
you know, or is it stunted because you've told, been told or it's, it's somehow been communicated to you that some thoughts are um, unacceptable. Yeah. So that gives us a feel for the, um, what creates self-worth within a family and within an individual. So in healthy families, there's an easy flow for self-worth. And in troubled families, it's very limited. In a dysfunctional family, it's actually blocked. There are three big rules in a really dysfunctional family. And what are the are, rules, Mary? Yeah, well, there's three of them okay. that are big. Okay. Don't talk. You never talk about anything important. We don't talk about really how we're really doing. We don't talk. We talk about, oh, the weather, or da, 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 you know. Yeah, yeah. Don't trust. Don't, you don't really trust that you can say what you need to say, do what you need to do without a repercussion. You don't trust outside the family, really. I was either. just going to say, yeah, that's inside your family, but that carries outside yep. into other areas of life. And don't feel. Yeah. Whatever feelings you have, keep them to yourself. I've worked with so many people who come in and they are actually afraid of their feelings. Yeah. yeah. They're, you know, when they have a feeling, they add to it with panic because they don't even know what to do with that. And they experience their feelings like tsunamis because they've like had to block their feelings so deeply. I have a woman right now that I'm working with where when she allows herself to feel, it comes in like a tsunami and she thinks she needs to go to behavioral health oh, right. because it's so terrifying to her. And what's the backstory on that? Mom, was, uh, mom had PTSD and would go off on her and yell and scream while she sat in a chair and had to absorb it. And so she had to completely swallow her feelings because mom got to have all of the feelings in the whole family. She has a, you know, a siblings who they just found activities elsewhere. She, for whatever reason, ended up stuck in that chair absorbing mom's triggered trauma. Wow. And so now her own feelings frighten her. Like I'm gonna lose control, maybe like mom, but they just come in like a tsunami. Yeah. So for so long, she just just survived that situation. She, she swallowed to, everything. She had to swallow it. Yeah. 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 And she found some really spectacular coping ways. I mean, she's actually a very, um, very intelligent, very functional person. But these this wound that emerges and then overwhelms her. I find a lot too where um, helping clients understand like it's okay to to have needs. And not only to have them, but for, to ask for them. Yeah, to ask for to them to be met. Yeah, ask for them yeah. to be met. Yeah, yeah. Where? And to release the outcome. Yeah. You know, because the thing that I see when you, when you say that, this makes me think of this. The thing that I see is that we come from this place where we, we never um, were able to ask for what we want or have our needs met or very rarely. And so now we'll accept only perfection. Oh. So if I ask, it has to be or it's all bad, it's all wrong. We don't know the middle. We just don't know the middle when we come from these um, dysfunctional places. It's like the notes on the on a piano. Over here, you've got the lower notes, which are great. Over here, you've got the higher notes. And of course, I'm gesturing this. Sarah's watching me do this <laughs> with my hands. And But that is not where you play the song. The song is played in the middle, just like your life. Occasionally, you use the notes that are lower. Occasionally, you, 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 you use the notes that are higher. But when you play the song of your life, there, now I'm banging on the table. The That's a great analogy. Um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the song is played yeah. in the middle. Wow. Yeah. And so those of us from ridiculous backgrounds, we know the notes on the different ends of the piano. And so we're not playing our own song. So right. I just, you know, I think in terms of, okay, so... You know, you just think about how in a, in a dysfunctional family, how's it, how's it going to work? How do you move freely when one of your parents is drunk on a regular basis? Might blow up, might disappear, might run off. How do you move freely if someone is yelling and screaming many nights? Mm -hmm. How do you move freely when you ask a question, you're shamed, hit, or ignored? If last night you were put in the car to drive around to try to catch your father having his affair. I've worked with countless people who, yeah. you know, mom would put them in the car. They were young and they'd drive around trying to catch dad because he's having an affair with somebody. I mean, who do you tell that to at the <laughs> lunch table right. the next day, right. you know, at school? You can't say, oh, well, here's what I did last night. Mm -hmm. My mom, we caught my dad last night. I mean, like, yikes. Yeah. 
you know, or how do you move freely if your older sister um, insults and harasses you every night and you have to share a room with her? I mean, I worked mm -hmm. with a woman um, a while back and that was the case. She had to share a bed with the sister who would say, you can't move, and she was much younger. You can't move beyond this on the bed. And she gave her a little piece of bed and then she'd maybe hit her or pinch her yeah. or just say really mean things to her. And if she complained, which at one point she did when she was like five, then she got a spanking because wow. that created disruption in yeah. the family. So she was taught, take it. To steal with it. Swallow it, yeah. take it. So the atmosphere in the troubled family, when I, um, when I sit with a troubled family, and I'm sure mm -hmm. you've had this experience too, yes. Sarah, and they come into my office, I honestly can feel my stomach kind of mm -hmm tighten and my back tighten and my shoulders can start to ache. I have to like shake yeah. off. That whole the, energy just comes oh, in the room. It's yeah. awful. Yeah. It's very uncomfortable. And they're, you know, the, their bodies are stiff and tight or slouchy. Their faces are sullen, sad, or blank. Their eyes look down or past people. Um, they can't hear anything. There's a lot of, what? Huh? What? Uh, huh? There's a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. I'll say, well, what do you mm -hmm. do? Huh? What? There's a lot of that. And their voices are barely audible. I mean, there, there'll be, you know, the families where people come in and they talk in this. And I'll go, um, you I'm really not no understanding. Idea what they said. I, yeah. yeah, I have no idea what you said. Yeah. And then when you ask them to repeat it, what do they do? the same thing over again. <laughs> again. <laughs> so there's no friendships in these families. There's no joy. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that they substitute for humor is sarcasm, which sarcasm is not truly humor. Sarcasm is a, I mean, I, I think the, um, the roots of the word of sarcasm mean ripping flesh. Mm -hmm. So it's just not your best choice for right. humor. Right. It's probably that passive aggressiveness that yeah that's why sarcasm maybe is allowed yeah I can't <laughs> I can't say anything straight up yeah so I'm just gonna put my side comment out and I'm so hurt so angry so wounded that it's like it's like the words have blood in them right it's bleeding yeah you know when I look at just the body posture of people um, in families like this I don't find it difficult to see why they have a lot of physical ailments. They seem to get sicker than other people. I mean, they, they just have a lot of neck and back problems, a lot of digestive problems. I mean, I, does that fit with what you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. And there's um, countless studies on how stress affects the body. So when you're living in that stressful, dysfunctional environment day in and day out, it's, it doesn't take a genius to figure out why that would be you know, why health conditions would be more prevalent in those families. Yeah. So before we end this podcast, of course, we do want to talk a little bit about the traits of a nurturing family. Yeah. And um, this is what um, comes to me. You know, in a nurturing family, in a family where um, we don't use violent words, language, there's a respect and a joy in other people's lives. What you see, what you experience is a sense of aliveness, honesty, genuine, genuineness, and love. When I sit with a family that is functioning, even though we're talking through a hard thing that has happened or they wouldn't be sitting in my office, they're, they're caring, they're, they're alive, there's an honesty. You know, if somebody starts to cry, somebody else gets up and gets a Kleenex for them. Mm -hmm. You know, or somebody, you know, reaches over and, and, and touches their hand. And the, the person doesn't pull away like, oh, instead yeah. they receive it. That they're because, used to yeah. that type of treatment. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's within the family. People feel listened to. Um, there's an interest in each other. Um, affection is shown as well as pain, as well as approval, as well as disapproval. All of those things are okay. Um, and you know, one of the biggest things in a nurturing family is that I see people being able to take risks. Sometimes I see it this way. 
you know, it's, it's like maybe figuring out life, especially that's especially what we do when we're maybe in our twenties and early thirties. It's like walking on a tightrope at the circus, which I actually hate watching, but, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but it works I, for this. heights are not my thing. But you know, when you come from a family where it's shaky in terms of your feeling of whether or not you're okay, whether you have access to all of you, you know, you, you might push through and try really hard and you walk in a tightrope that isn't too far above the ground mm. because you could fall. And yeah. so you don't take as many chances or risks. I truly believe that if you have that feeling like you have people, you have family, you have love, you can go to the highest point, the highest tightrope, and you dare to walk across because you have a safety net right. and you know it. And so I can take this risk. You know, it's like that kid in the playground who um, they, if the bully comes to them, they just, they can just verbally push them back or blow them off because their feeling is I've got people, I got people <laughs> behind me. Right. But the kid who doesn't have that, and they're of course the kids most likely to be targeted. targeted. Yeah. They, there's a collapse inside. And that doesn't mean that every kid who's bullied is a kid from a dysfunctional family. I don't mean that. Mm -hmm. um, the kid who's bullied, who's from a functional family, you know, has the wonderful thing of being able to go home and talk about it and what it's like and, you know, you not have to carry it around and make it about them, but to be able to talk it through. And there'll be some, you know, attempt at problem solving and all kinds of things. Again, these things happen to all families. Right. But when you're from that dysfunctional family, when you're from that really troubled family, your choices are limited in terms of how you're gonna um, respond to yeah. what's happening, absolutely. You know, the other thing in nurturing families is you can see people um, just value and love each other. And just the way people look at each other in a nurturing family, they don't look through each other and they speak in very clear voices. They don't mumble. That mumbling thing, <laughs> what is that? Well, we know what it is, we just said, but anyway, it's just like, I'll hear it, I'll go, what are you doing? Just come on. Um, and anything can be talked about, disappointments, fears, hurts, angers, criticisms, as well as joy and achievements. I mean, I'll yeah. have people say, I'm sorry, but is it okay if I blow my own horn? And I go, of course, of course. <laughs> blow your horn, <laughs> absolutely. When my sons call me to tell me, mom, Here's what I just did, and it just went really, really, I'm just thrilled. I want to know that. <laughs> right. But see, what I've seen is people with poor self-esteem, who they don't, they don't feel good about themselves, they can't handle it when their kids do. Well, yeah. don't be thinking too much of yourself. Or, yeah. Don't oh, be you bragging. Just think, yeah, don't <laughs> brag. And, or there's a jealousy yeah. that parents will have of their own children. Planning happens in nurturing functional families. You know, you can plan a trip, but it's not set in stone. It's not yeah. this freak out. Well, at 11.45, we're going to, or we're going to, it isn't that. There's a plan. It's loose. It's flexible because we have to attend to the people who are there. Right. There's always that awareness of that. Yeah. And so in these families, as I said earlier, parents are not bosses. They're leaders. They are the architects of the family. They're the ones who are gonna be coming up with the rules, written, um, unwritten, most of them unwritten, and most of them um, not really thought out, unfortunately. So it's my hope that this um, particular podcast prompts you to think about your own background and what maybe didn't get attended to within you that now you could begin to notice very gently and, and know that you can find ways to release, to fill, to know. Um, and if you're a parent listening to this podcast, begin to bring the parenting style you have to consciousness. Do what you do on purpose. Right. That was my hope for this podcast too, is that you know, as a child, you can't control these things, but as an adult and as you work towards, 
increasing your self-awareness is that you, like you said, parent on purpose, live on purpose um, to stop that cycle of dysfunction. Right. Creating the culture that you want um, in your home and in your life. So our next podcast is going to go deeper into this and into what happens in the dysfunctional family when people are not allowed to be who they are. Because what really does start to happen is people have to then turn into a role, mm -hmm. you know, a caricature, rather than a full human being. So until then, I'm going to encourage everyone to listen to Sarah's quick wrap up here of the podcast, and then I'll do my little closing thing that I like to do. <laughs> All right. Um, first, before I start my wrap up, or maybe it's part of my wrap up, I just wanted to um, let everyone know that this is definitely Mary's forte and something that she has spent her career working extensively on. And there would be absolutely no client that I wouldn't refer to her if they were having um, any type of dysfunctional family issues. Uh, Mary does great work with that. So Thank you. She's not going to tell us, maybe. But <laughs> um, so again, um, in order to focus on what we want, we want to make sure you have something to take away. And Mary touched on those in terms of increasing your self-awareness, not only exploring your own family of origin issues, but also working on creating a better future for your own family going forward. Mm -hmm. so. And your life. And your own life, yeah. yes. Yeah. And remember to, um, that we have an email. We'd love to hear from you. And the email is unscriptedletstalk at gmail.com, all one word. And let us know um, your thoughts, questions, other topics you'd like to hear, whatever comes to mind. Good jokes, I'm always good up for a good <laughs> joke. So until then, Remember to live your life with purpose, passion, and intention. Until next time.